somebody came out with this question of like, Hey, you're super excited, but how does that translate? You know, we've done this before. And I said, actually, we haven't done this before, right? We had the performance triad. And what did we invest in performance triad? A bunch of brochures that sat around the hospital. This is the first time in my 25 year career that the army is actually invested in the program. They have dedicated resources. They have committed personnel. We're investing across the board in this because I think it, you know, the reason I'm so committed to H2F is because I believe, I truly, truly believe that we're investing in the total soldier. Welcome back to another week, uh, another episode of Mops and Moe's podcast with Drew and Alex. Hitting one a little bit closer to home, at least for me, here at Fort Bragg. Alex, who are we talking to? We are talking to Colonel John Harvey, U.S. Army Field Artillery Officer and Commander of the 18th Field Artillery Brigade at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Woo! He has commanded soldiers at every level from small wait a second, units wait a second, wait a second. to brigade. Fort Liberty, depending on when you're listening to this. I, I, we always not have Fort to Liberty spec- yet. We always have to specify that so these episodes can remain timely. It, uh, it's not Fort Liberty yet, and I refuse to acknowledge when it becomes Fort Liberty. <laughs> we're we're going to do a quick sidebar, and I'll continue with the introduction of Colonel Harvey afterwards. It is my understanding, and I don't know for sure whether this is true, but the reason supposedly that Fort Bragg is becoming Fort Liberty rather than being named after a particular soldier, considering how many historically noteworthy soldiers there are that can trace their lineage to Fort Bragg is apparently because 18th Airborne Corps and USASOC, U.S. Army Special Operations Command, the two major commands that call Fort Bragg home, could not come to an agreement on which community's paratrooper deserved to have the installation named after them. And because they could not agree, nobody gets anything. All the toys are taken away. We got Fort Liberty instead. Fort Liberty. (laughs) Hopefully that's true. Otherwise, we just started a hell of a rumor. Anyway, back to Colonel Harvey. Back to the bio. (laughs) Uh, like I said, committed at every level from small unit up to brigade with extensive staff experience, including the joint staff, the army staff and U S forces, Afghanistan, his postings have taken him all over the world from Korea to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to Fort drum, New York, to Washington, DC, and now to the center of the universe, Fort Bragg, AKA Fort Liberty. Operationally, he has served in Kosovo. Afghanistan, Iraq, and even Haiti for hurricane relief stuff, or earthquake relief stuff, rather. He has a bachelor's in political science from Eastern New Mexico University, a master's from the Army Command and General Staff College, and a counterterrorism and public policy fellowship from Duke University, where he focused on military senior leader decision-making and the Army's professional military education of staff officers. So for, for folks that are unfamiliar with the way that the army works uh, and specifically with the way that H2F or the army's new embedded human performance setup works. Colonel Harvey is a brigade commander oversees several thousand soldiers. And in this context specifically, and the reason we wanted to talk to him is he is in charge of his own embedded human performance team. So as an H2F team, you report directly to your brigade commander And I will tell you from within 18th Airborne Corps, he is one of those brigade commanders who is incredibly forward leaning with regards to maximizing the resources at his disposal, the strength coaches, the dietitians, the physical therapists. So when we, when we set down to plan how we wanted to engage the conversation at a brigade commander level, Colonel Harvey was one of those names that rose to the top. And I think hopefully with the way this episode goes, you'll see why that's the case. And You've probably heard us discuss it a little bit. Certainly, it's a frequent topic on the Instagram page. But when when people are talking about embedded human performance in military settings, especially in conventional military settings, one of the most frequent things you hear come up is the conversation of buy-in. How do we get leaders to care? How do we get leaders to champion this thing? And I think you will hear pretty clearly in this conversation with Colonel Harvey that the 18th Field Artillery Brigade has no issues with buy-in. Uh, their their commander is all in 110 um, percent in fact if you look at his instagram page it almost seems like more of what he does is 
physical readiness training than leading a field artillery brigade. And I am sure that is because it lends itself to pictures a little bit more than brigade command and staff meetings tend to, but it, it shows the level of passion this guy has for making the system work, for making the most of it, for ensuring that his brigade is absolutely dominating, not just physical fitness, but all components of health, wellness, performance. Enjoy. You basically own a human performance program for all intents and purposes. And I'm curious about, I mean, this is probably a super highbrow question to kick things off with, but like, how do you change culture? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> the big one. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's entire authors that have written about how to change culture, right? Like, sure, there's sure. like important things, and I'm not one of them. But, you know, what I'll tell you is from a fitness perspective, Unlike some of the other challenges that, that, you know, any leader walks into, right? You walk in an organization, there's things you don't like, there's things that need to be changed, there's things tied to your personality. Like, like those things take a lot of deliberate planning and effort. Where, what I, here's what I found. So I came into the job I'm in now. H2F was, was a thing, but not here yet. So we had the director, we had no coaches. There was all these promises, promises about all the staff we were going to get. We had Jim in the boxes, but, you know, kind of here, kind of there. Right. But, but the brigade had not really come into it. They were coming out of COVID. They were just starting back to unit PT. So, so what I found when I, you know, about maybe a month into the job is when I I'm standing there with my brigade star major and, and we just are watching PT go and said, Holy moly, you know, can you imagine, could, think about us as Lieutenant Private 25 years ago, push-up, sit-ups, two-mile run. Maybe it was a two-mile run and push-up, sit-ups. Maybe it was just a six-mile run. And now here we are watching this entire footprint with music blaring, you know, marker boards up, workouts on the board, and, and just watching soldiers embrace it. So I don't think H2F PT – was hard to get by in with because I think that the majority of the formation, you know, the older guys were tired of PT. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years. How many more miles can I put on a pair of Brooks? Right? Like, come on. And, and, uh, and so I don't think it was hard to, to get the buy-in to do this. I think what, what is hard and what is still hard is, now that the program is in, now that we have coaches, now that we have ATs, now that we have PTs, what's next? How do we get better? How do we improve? How do we, you know, our, our performance is, is marketably better than it was 18 months ago. Okay, but that's not good enough. How do we get to the next thing? Because those little tweaks are what, what I personally find hard to get put in organizationally. So, you know, for example, we, we realize that when a, a unit breaks up and they look at the board, and they're like, okay, A, B, C, whatever the, the style of programming is today, what do they do? They cluster their buddies to work out with. Well, you know, your buddy may or may not be the best person to push you to your best optimal performance. So, you know, we, we try to put in ability groups. We tried to put in a testing program to figure out like, hey, who are the big kids that need to be in the strong program and who are the, the intermediates and who are the builders and who are the newbies? And, and what we found was a lot of organizational resistance because, oh, I'm the leader and I have to be with those people and blah, blah, blah. And, and so those tweaks, you know, we, we just made a tweak on Friday that, you know, we kind of did a self assessment with, man, you know, our cardio, our distance cardio, our endurance cardio, not where we want to be. So, so we sat down collectively, coaches, programmers, our strength fitness, tra our, our soldier fitness trainers, and said, hey, what do we do, right? And, and now, you know, there's friction, right? Oh, well, Friday, we don't want to do cardio. Well, tough luck. We kind of are not doing like we're supposed <laughs> to, right? So, you know, that's where the challenge comes. And, and to get buy-in, the culture change like that, it just takes, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of force uh, and, a, and a lot of freaking show me out of the leaders across the organization. Mm -hmm. So... I got, I know a lot of our questions coming up are probably going to end up talking about organizational leadership and all that kind of stuff, but I want to start with one that's very much like a personal experience kind of thing. You, you had that line about how many more miles can I put on a pair of Brooks? And I was talking to a friend a few months ago who was taking over battalion command 
And there's this idea from a lot of people that when you go into like strategic or staff assignments or broadening assignments or whatever it is, you get to like take care of yourself and get healthy again and get in good shape and all that stuff. And then you go back to the line and you get broken down by being like forced into these workouts that wear you down and, and you end up with these injuries and you're not in as good shape as you could be. And that for kind of obvious reasons, seems like the opposite of the way it should be, right? You should be in like prime physical condition if you're in a line assignment. Have you experienced stuff like that before? Has that been a challenge you've been through over the course of your career? And it seems like things might be different now with the culture you've built there. Is that the case? Yeah. So I would tell you my personal experience is a hundred percent opposite of that. When I was a, a battery commander with soldiers and was out every day, even though it was old school PT, you know, push up, sit ups, two mile run. I was still every day in it, right? And if I tweaked something, there was a battalion aid station. There, there may not have been ATs and PTs, but there was access. What I found in both of my trips to the Pentagon was just the opposite, right? Like I'm struggling. I'm struggling to get motivated. I'm struggling to know what to do. I'm struggling to, ah, do I really have time to get to the gym today? You know, and I'm looking for excuses or making excuses not to do it. Now, I had a great leader in my first job. I was like, hey, every day we're going to the gym. And in my, in my second job, the shift, the timing allowed me to hit a personal gym with a friend to, to motivate me through. But what I didn't have is anything else, right? If I'm out for a, a run and all of a sudden the hip doesn't feel right, I, I got through it. I quit running for two weeks. I just try and heal it up, right? Because I can't just walk over to my aid station and be like, hey, something's wrong. I, I personally think that those you know strategic assignments, and, and believe me, I'm headed into one, and I'm already emotionally – trying to cope with the fact that I'm about to lose my coaches and lose my ATs and PTs. And I think I'm going to grieve that loss the most when I leave this job. But as I go into a job, then I know it's going to be like that again. But I think, you know, with the access and what we have in the programs, there is no reason why you should, why every person should not be in their optimal physical conditioning and, and health in a unit versus kind of off on their own. The resources are just freaking unbelievable. I mean, we are now staffed like a small college it's an athletic program. Like, you're not going to get that in Pentagon. I'm not going to get that in my next job. I, I literally just got a text early, like two hours ago from a friend who's at the Pentagon. He's like, hey, I, I'm going to have to go to Best Ranger soon. These guys out here all have coaches all of a sudden. Like, who do I go to at the Pentagon to train me to I can compete with these guys that all have this? Like, what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because if you don't get to it, you know, and, and that's... You know, I, I, I clearly I'm not criticizing how long it's taken to put in, right? It, it, putting in this program, I understand it's a huge commitment in money. It's a huge commitment in time and resources, you know, but if I was going to say anything, not necessarily go faster, but go bigger, right? And I don't mean more staff. I think that for the unit I'm in, the number of people we have, good enough. Would I like two more coaches that I'm 100% one coach to one battery? Sure. Are we good enough at 10? 100%. But what I'll tell you is I watch my peers who don't have H2F and, and I am trying to be, you know, the biggest advocate by, you know, I presented at the H2F conference last year. Uh, hopefully I get to go back again this year. You know, I'm advocating for, Hey, everybody needs this, right? We need this in our schoolhouses. We need this in the units that don't have it now. Like if you don't go across the total army, you got haves and have nots. And then, you know, you know, it just, it just isn't going to have the optimal effect we want it to. Do you, and I don't want to pretend to know kind of the intricacies of how you guys run your program. Um, but I know one of the, one of the chief, we'll call it complaints that we hear from H2F staff, particularly coaches is that there's this friction point, right. In, in some organizations where you have these guys and gals that have tons of experience, degrees, you know, training histories, and they want to be able to do what they do best, which is coach. And then on the other hand, you do have this army culture of, you know, PT as a leadership opportunity, NCOs leading the charge, learning what they can from the coaches and, and implementing that. And I, I understand both sides of that argument. And I'd be curious as to your take on that, what it means to embed a, a human performance professional into a unit, but then tell them that in some cases that they can't coach because you mentioned you know, Hey, we're, we're the equivalent of like a small university. And I would agree with that, but I don't think you would ever walk into a university and have the quarterback running the lift session because the strength coach is just kind of sitting back consulting. So I'm just curious in, in kind of how you guys approach that. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and if you want a little bit later, I can give you some of my thoughts on the whole soldier athlete where I think we are probably going a little too far with this college campus uh, example that a lot of leaders are talking about, uh, just my opinion. But, but so, so to your question about h- how, do you, how do you make it all work, the upside of the program is that when the Army put it into brigade level, they said, hey, brigade commanders, you, you don't have doctrine. You don't have a bunch of books. Go figure this out. Shape your organization with these new resources. And, and, and big Army, you know, Arctic, they're like, hey, go take a couple of years. And they've got this great team that goes out and studies us and best practices. And da, da, da. So they gave us that freedom. The downside to that freedom is uh, sometimes you get what you ask for, right? If a, if a commander is in, they're in. If they're not in, they're not going to embrace it. you got a huge staff that sits around. Mm-hmm. From from my now to get specific to what you asked me, in in my I can only tell you how how I I kind of threaded this needle because I saw the same conflict right. So the the approach that we take is that PT is leader led, advised and built by the pros, right? So the way we I have our program kind of functioning is a coach, an H two F coach. They sit down with that battery leadership and over, depending on what kind of phase they're in, what kind of cycle they're in, maybe it's a four week program, maybe it's a one week spin down, maybe it's a, a six or an eight week, you know, they build the program. And then when, when it comes to the actual execution, coaches standing at the board, coaches demonstrating the exercises while the NCO uh, is going, Hey, this is how we're doing it. This is what we're doing. You know, starting so-and-so you're in charge of a group, you're in charge of B group. And then, and then the, the coach is there to do what I really, really, really need them to do, which is coach. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't really need them leading stretching exercises, right? That's warrior leader skills. That's basic stuff. But, you know, and, and I've even taken it a step farther with a program we run inside this organization called the Steel Fitness Trainer. So to get even better buy-in for those NCOs that are leading the PT section – I, I bring them down and, and for lack of a better term, I indoctrinate them with the coaches. I have coaches, ATs, PTs, and for a week, they're in here with that mid-grade NCO population, teaching them the lifts, teaching them how to program, teaching them the cues, teaching them how to tip soldiers so that not only do I get a combat multiplier, right? Because now I have more, you know, just below the threshold of a coach coach. Uh, but now when they're all fighting over, well, how do we approach this new cardio program we need to embrace? They're kind of already thinking in the way the coaches think, right? Because they spend time. I mean, coaches and, and the studio fitness trainers see each other at least twice a week outside of PT just for programming and, and planning and, and execution. So, so I do think it's a very fine needle to have to thread, right? Of I, I want the pros on the field. I want the pros leading but I also don't want to take a commander and go, hey, dude, throw your hands up and say that you're not in charge for this hour and a half and that you're just going to turn this over to somebody else. Because here's the worst fear. What happens when the coach is gone? Well, we've already seen this. We've had a few coaches that have gotten better opportunities. One's gone on to be a lead. Okay, well, now we've got a vacancy. And and we go, you know, two, three weeks. So So if we don't have some blending of the – soldier leader responsibility with the coaches when you know they go off to CEUs, they go off somewhere else, then then you got this gap that nobody can fill. And I got units just standing around going, look, no coach to lead PT. And and that's not a recipe that we really want, I don't think. Yeah, no, I think it's a valid point. And I mean, I, I don't I don't know the answer to this this kind of follow on question necessarily, but it does kind of bring to bear you know, we talk about culture change. We talk about paradigm shifts. The the change that I think the, for me, it goes both ways, right? Like there's a change that the military is going to have to accept in terms of surrendering some responsibility of PT over to a professional. Yep. However, I would argue there's also a change that the, we'll call it the tactical strength and conditioning industry is going to have to accept, which is that, Hey, a, a certain percentage of your role is going to be educational because there is one of you for, you know, whatever, 500 to a thousand of these other people. And so it's interesting too that you mentioned kind of the small college example and that sort of thing because they deal with the problems that you mentioned. The the coach goes out of town. There's a plan in place. The coach gets hired off to another university. There's a plan in place. But I, I do think that there's some 
there's something to be said about this middle ground. And again, I don't, there's not even really a question there, just more of a, a thought experiment of like, I wonder what that looks like five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Is it an MOS? Is it a slightly altered coaching role? I don't know, but it's an interesting conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm with you. And I do think, like I said, I even struggled with what do I do with my PD, right? My program director, how does he fit into, I mean, you want to talk about expert of experts, right? Here's the GS employee who's shepherding all five of these. One of those happens to be a uniform wearing chaplain. Uh, you know, some of them happen to be uniform wearing BH. You know, how, how do I, how do I weave that in and thread that in to where he has enough authority and responsibility given the fact that he's this new civilian on the brigade level staff, right? Like I, I saw that by putting him in my front office and, calling him my, my chief of fitness. I quit doing that eventually because I realized it was putting out this message that PH2F was only fitness. But, you know, for the first <laughs> six months, you kind of get his head around, hey, we got to go to Jason. Jason's got authority. Jason's got responsibility. The boss trusts Jason, you know. But it took that kind of a visual thing to get it started. Chief of fitness is awesome. <laughs> you talked about the the relationship with like how the NCOs do it and how it's leader led and coach advised and things like that. I do want to shout out. I'm I'm lucky enough to know Josh Bell. I've bumped into him a few times, AUSA, yeah. NSCA, things like that. But but you guys grabbed him and put him in a spot where you have a, like a uniformed non commissioned officer in a leadership position with your embedded human performance. What has that done to enhance the program? How's that benefited you guys? So so you know first. I, I got to say, as much as I love Master Sergeant Bell, it was a unique opportunity. Uh, I was not looking for it. He's in a particular place to where it made sense for all the right reasons. My organization, where he was assigned, made all the sense for the right reasons, right? So, so I, I will say that with a little bit of trepidation that I don't go – you know, talking externally about, oh, you know, I had to put this mass start in the program, right? Like I didn't have to, it was just a, you know, it worked out. So I did. Now that, with that caveat in place, I will tell you that when he leaves, I, I will absolutely be looking for a replacement for him because where, where the team is really, really strong and where the team is, is really good is not making PowerPoint slides. It's not inputting data to DTMS. It's it's not creating fragos for the you know quarterly fitness events we do. Uh, it's not for plan and steel fitness day, right? Like th there are just some things that as good as the team is, that, that's not their bag. And so having a, a senior NCO over there to, you know, just kind of make, make sure that, hey, you know, boss wants to do this thing. Uh, it's H2F. We, we, we call it sharpening steel. We do it once a quarter. It's usually some kind of fitness event with some kind of knowledge based uh, on the rest of the pillars and some practical exercises. It's usually about a half day event we do. But like somebody's got to put that in a frying pan. It tasks soldiers to set it up and task moving. And, and so I, I think it absolutely is invaluable from that perspective. Uh, for him, I think personally, it's extremely valuable because it's kind of lean him towards you know, I'm basically running my own, you know, career skills program for him for what he wants next, which I'm happy to do that because he deserves it. He's a great NCO, he's done great work. So I'm happy. There's There's been a few cases where we've kind of been lucky enough to, that that works out, unique situation, like whether it's somebody who's separating and wants to do that as their career or has a background in it or whatever it is. And as you pointed out, it's not, it's not a real position. So it has to be kind of no. a unique situation where it works out for them. Do you think, given how much value you've gotten out of it, that it would be worth the investment by the army to make that an official position. Is that something that would, would benefit people professionally, even if it wasn't just a one-off lucky situation? Um, no, I, I think the answer is no. And, and the reason is because the, the way you said that question was benefit them professionally. I think it would benefit any NCO um, or any young officer immensely personally but professionally, if they're not touching their MOS, that they're not touching soldiers in day-to-day -day leadership, if they're not touching their jobs. I, I, and the other thing I worry about is if we start going, hey, just, you know, everybody task it at start first class to do this job. Okay. But they're really just filling a small niche. And so eventually we're going to be like, oh, well, do we really need the PD? Or do we really need that? Do we really need that? Do we really need that? 
just but use borrowed military manpower for it. I, I can't pull this off. You know, back to your first question about weaving the the balance between pro and and amateur. Like you can't plug military into everything if you want to perform at the level that the army's asking us to perform at. And so, you know, I think there's a, I think there's a date, a little bit of silver stroke, but I also think it's very good for him professional for a, you know, pick run of the mill. Like, I don't think that is a position. The organization is a, a good professional position. How do you maintain kind of this people first element with this thing? And, we, and we've asked this question a couple of different ways to a couple of different guests, because if you really boil down these embedded programs, the idea is to treat soldiers as individuals. And and I think that that makes sense. It briefs well, but at the same time, there's just so many of them that there is what I would call like an industrialized component to all of this. So I'm curious as in your position as a brigade commander, like how do you manage the scale of things while also accounting for the individual nuance of everybody that you're dealing with? Well, you know, at first, I had this kind of weird reaction when you asked the question, because to me, at least in this organization, I think H2F is the embodiment of people first, mm-hmm. right? When, when I, you know, and I'm not talking about the bumper stickers and all that stuff, like, but, but when I think of taking care of people, right, just the simplicity of, of taking care of, of the humans that are in this organization, H2F is it, right? It's whether you want to get stronger, we can help you with that. If you want to get either, you know, bigger or smaller, we can help you with that. If you want to have a connection to the world and the connection to your peers, we can help you with that. If you want, you know, all of these things, if you want to get stronger mentally, more, you know, dare I say the word resilient, we have a person for that. If you have an injury and want to get healed up, we have a, I, I can't think of anything that, that better embodies caring for people or people first uh, than H2F. The, the nuance to your question about how do you balance the industrialization uh, across, you know, 1,250 people versus a staff of, you know, a total of 24 at the end of the day across all components of the program, you you know, and it may be, and I have to caveat that we're a little unique, right? So the the type, this type of brigade, a a battery company is about 85 people, Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have 144 people standing in formation. So, I think it's relatively easy for a coach to build a personal relationship over a period of time with 80 some people. And I see that because I hit the gym every day at lunch because I work with a coach. I've worked, you know, I take a coach for eight weeks. We work on different things. I've, you know, never power cleaned in my life. And now I've got a coach who's, you know, dead set on turning this 47 year old into a power cleaning phenom, right? Like that's his thing. And that's what we're going to do by God. And, but, but I see it because I see soldiers out of the formation who are in the gym at lunch with their coach one-on-one. So I know there's, there's this, the personal connection is there to kind of take off the, Hey, this is the program. This is what we're doing today. And, and I see it with the care the coaches put in, right? They take the time they're building individual programs. Like I go around the formation, you know, and I show up and like, Hey, sir, you don't have a card, so why don't you follow in with these guys? And I look at the cards and like, you know, private so-and-so has a card and Sergeant so-and-so has a card and it tells me, hey, based on my percentage of numbers, like, so, so the connection is there, I think, to take that. Same thing with AT uh, and PT, right? I'm only got, I've got five ATs, three PTs, but, you know, whether it's mobility class, whether it's our, uh, our this newer class, we're starting to do some, some light non-injury physical therapy like dry needling and cupping and some of the you know foam uh, not foam rolling but uh body tempering like like th- th- that's like there's small pockets who are gravitating towards that because our ats are out during formation they're building relationships and our pts are out you know leading you know helping lead for forger pt so those sorts of like hey i can get extra treatment by coming over here at noon cool i'm in right and so so i think that's how it is but again i, I have a full realization that you know we are not a 5,000 plus brigade combat mm-hmm. team that, that only has a staff of, you know, whatever they've got 50, 60, I don't know what it is, but it's not, mm-hmm. it's not the ratio is way different. So I, I want to ask you, I'm going to weave a story here, but it's going to culminate in the question, which is how do you measure effectiveness? But I want to go about it because we had Newton Chang came on uh, and he's the health and health and wellness manager for, for Google. And we asked him how they do this because we wanted to know at that level for an, for an organization like that, 
are you given the latitude to move beyond objective metrics of performance, simple PT tests, you know, red, yellow, green, all the stuff that the army loves. And as I hear you talk about the individual component of all of this, you, you mention a lot of those subjective things, like the experience that your soldiers have with these programs. So how do you measure the effectiveness of that? given that we are operating in a world in the army where it is very mechanized it's it's very robotic in the sense that we measure things in in part number we measure things across time it's very cut and dry and now we're introducing this human element to all of this what does effectiveness look like for you all right so i'm going to give you a, probably a, a pretty long, long answer which please do really short short and brief up till now so i'm, I'm known for short and brief uh, because there's some complexity here that I think is super important, right? So why does H2F exist? H2F exists because the Army was transitioning from a insufficient fitness measure of the PT test to a much more comprehensive version of the overall soldier fitness through the ACFT. So at its base and core, why does H2F exist? to score 600 on the ACFT. And that might be a slight exaggeration, but like in everybody, every, even though not every soldier has to achieve a 600, not everyone will, in their minds, you know, an op, you know, a positive soldier who sets goals and wants to get better every day, in their mind, they should be a someday I'm going to get to a 600. I may be at a 480 now, whatever. That's where I want to be. I want to be excellent. I want to be perfect. So H2F exists to get soldiers to that fitness level. And if they get injured, which they might, if they've never deadlifted before, if they've never done a drag, you know, that's an injury, you know, like they may end up having to go through some treatment to get back into the fight. Right. So, so at the end of the day, I don't think that using the ACFT as a metric against H2F program is a bad idea because it, it is what it's for. And so we should, and we're seeing it in the brigade now, right? Like, when I look back at the test that was taken in April versus the test we took in July, we, we saw about a nine point marked advantage across the board. And all that really changed was we had coaches full time across the brigade and we were doing better PT that was guided by coaches. Right. That's really the only thing we changed. So then you go from our, our that to our fall PT, ACFT to our spring. It like we're doing it right now. So I'm expecting to see, again, average scores go up again because I know the effort that's going into PT. The, the other part of this that I think is important, and, and I, I think we have to be careful of, of undervaluing, and this is where I think we could, it would be exciting to see more commitment by big A Army programming, is at the end of the day, you can't get enough data. And while I understand, I'm going to talk to your point about the subjectiveness about it here in a minute, um, the the quantifiables of it are at the heart of the importance of the program because if we as leaders if i can't go to my my boss and say hey boss we have measured x and we see gain y whether it's sleep quality whether it's food consumption whether it's the amount of of snickers bars that are no longer coming out of the snack machines whether it's you know the 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 what, you know, the Gatorade is selling out before the diet Pepsi, what, whatever it is that we're, we're after, right? If we can't show that, it's one thing to say, hey, our soldiers are fitter, better, stronger, faster, or whatever, you know, oh, look at their PT scores. But, you know, I, I wear a particular gadget, which I'm not endorsing, just like I'm not endorsing Brooks uh, as a running shoe. There are other running shoes. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of other running shoes. They're all, all very good. You know, why, but why do, why do I wear that gadget? Because I'm working out twice a day. I have a, a particular fitness goal I'm in. I'm 47 years old. I don't have an athletic background. And so all that data is helping me drive and customize my program with my coaches and with my dietitian and, and with my cognitive performance bus, right? She, I didn't even know I had an RMR and an HRV until like a year ago. And now I, I play brain games to try and get my HRV up, right? Like these are things that, Data is giving me the knowledge to try and take apart. And so this is where I, I hope the Army can, can be fast, flexible, nimble, and agile to say, hey, start taking technology, right? Start wearing this device, start wearing that device. Because I can't, I can't really assess my program 
if I'm stuck with subjective assessments of, hey, soldier, how'd you sleep last night? Sir, I got 10 hours. Bullshit. You don't get, nobody gets 10 hours, right? Like a sleep, you may be in bed for 10 hours, but you ain't getting 10 hours of sleep, right? And so until we can balance, hey, how does a soldier sleep? What kind of nutrition were they on? What was their work effort and work performance today? What was their output at the end? What is that against their strength? Now, this is where I get into the college thing, right? Like hmm. these are resources that if you want us to create collegiate level athletes, we need the resources to be able to, you know, if you go to the college that I root for on Saturdays for football, every second of your life is tracked, measured, quantified, and captured, and then briefed back to you on what's going on with you and why are you not increasing performance. We don't have those tools, right? We mm-hmm. can send them to the DFAC, but we're not actually tracking what they eat. We, we aren't really, we aren't tracking their heart rate. We aren't tracking their sleep. We aren't, you know, there's all these other data points that coaches, if they had access to them, could even start to dial in that programming anymore. So, so that's why I don't, I don't, I, you know, I, I think capturing data digitally, passively, super important. If we really want this thing to go from an awesome program to, you know, just skyrocketing uh, with results and fine tuning. And, and then I think that gets, you know, to your last point about subjectiveness. So, right. You ask, do I have the freedom to be subjective in my assessments? I, I think I have the freedom to do that. I, I think that it's more, the subjective assessments are more important to me internally than externally. Like, so when I, I go out and I do, you know, PT with pick a unit, uh, like I did this morning and, I, and I'm watching these guys work out and I'm, I'm listening to what's going on and I'm watching the interactions like that's subjective feedback when a soldier, you know, today we were doing, you know, deadlifts as part of the, the H2F workout in, a, in the battery I was in. Right. And there were a couple of soldiers that were like, hey, I want to try 10 more pounds this week. And then they did it. And there was a little, you know, cheering, Woo, you know, these guys, you know, everybody was on. Right. That subjective feedback is super important to me because it tells me we're aimed in the right direction. It tells me that we're getting to the initial soldiers. It tells me we're building confidence. But, but to go external with that and go, hey, boss, I was at PT today and I, you know, I got this objective. Assi-. Like, I don't think that helps the army mm-hmm. say that the multi-billion dollar investment in in the program is actually making our force fitter, faster, stronger, better. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think there's there's got to be a balance. Because if I was getting bad subjective reviews at me as the commander, that would tell me I have to dial it different. I have to change something. The program is not functioning well. We're not, we're not, you know, if all I do is gather it up, it's a bunch of sad faces. Like, oh, I don't want to bring a new day again today. We did, uh, yeah. Okay, hey guys, you know, we need to, we need to turn the dial here because we are not reaching the soldiers. That, that's where I think the difference is between quantitative and qualitative assessment. Sure. And, and I want to follow on with kind of, I mean, maybe this is a devil's advocate question, but you'd mentioned, you know, the purpose of all of this is a 600 on the ACFT. And we, and we hear that all the time. And I don't think it's necessarily, wrong but my my question would be you know hypothetically what if acft what if acft scores didn't change at all but you know for example suicide went down or acft scores didn't change at all or how about this one acft scores went up everyone hit a 600 but injuries are through the roof like i i guess how how do you think we we balance that within this conversation of hey we are only aiming for this one thing at the expense of everything else yeah, I, I, that that's a that's a great way to put that question. I think the way you you put the last part of it is probably the 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 most relevant counterexample, right? Everybody they can take the test and get an ACFT, but forty percent of your formation can't take the ACFT because they're broken, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and so you know, I'm going to turn it a little bit and say that's back to the data. And and to me, so so we run this program inside the brigade called Reforger. I'm super excited about this program. Uh, and and with all credit due, uh, I ripped it off from 10th Mountain Division, who run a program called Unbreakable Warrior. And I happened to command a battalion there. And I got here and I said, Jason, we're doing this. And so we went to drum. We took their program. I got ATs. I said, take this, modify it for us. We're going to do this. So for me to be able to, to, to look at the data of, hey, our score's going up. Good. That means our programming is in the right direction. Do we have soldiers that were underperforming that are now on average? Good. That's, but Hey, what about this population over here? And so I have to see that data once a month. I look at the profile data and I look at reforger 
we look at who's attending. We look at the, like we have, so, so I'm an artillery guy and we, we talk about should hit data versus did hit data. Where do you aim the artillery bullet versus where does it actually go? And sometimes there's errors that make it wrong. Right. So, so to me, I'm looking at when was that profile supposed to expire based on the soldier being healthy? Are, are we hitting it? Are we overshooting it or undershooting it? Right now, I'm super excited. What we are finding is about 50% of our profiles are coming off profile five duty days before their expected profile would expire. That's data that I want. That's telling me that my recovery program is there. The other piece of data, we have yet to have a single soldier go into reforger for an injury, come back into that program a second time around for a repeat injury. Now, they may have an ankle and a shoulder that puts them in the program, but that shoulder that we put them through reforger for is no longer a problem because the program is built to, to strengthen, make it better, right? And I'm just bragging on the brigade at this point. But, but, but the point is, like, you have to see, to you, you have to see both sides. Because mm-hmm. if you only say, hey, we got a 600 ACATFT, great, only one person took it, right? Like, the, the averages now matter as much as the data matters and what your denominator is matters. And, and I, my opinion, if you're, if you're breaking more than you're curing, then you have to get into the other, like H2F is not just fitness, right? It's, it's a total soldier approach. And so if you're only looking at fitness as, as a commander and saying, Hey, that one pillar is all I care about. 680 ACFT. Okay. The other four have a lot to do. You know, I would argue that the spirituality pillar has a lot to do with suicide prevention. I would argue that the spirituality pillar to a degree has a lot to do with preventing sharp incidents, preventing EO incidents, right? It's how do you see other humans in your space? How do you respect them? How do you treat them? Right? So, you know, as we break down that pillar, that's, that's an important message that's got to come through to it. How do you quantify that? You can't, right? How do you quantify a negative that we didn't, you know, our, our suit, we didn't, nobody, the thought about killing themselves did. You can't do that, right? You can't quantify that. Mm-hmm. You can just hope that those those kind of things come as a, a, a goodness of the program. Mm-hmm. So I was I was going to bring you back to the the HF is only fitness thing that you mentioned earlier, but you you got there on your own. So I'm going to ask to like kind of follow up on it a little bit. How do you message? Because we've talked a lot here about the physical fitness piece, about injuries and ACFTs and and all of that. But given that you clearly at some point identified that there was like an overemphasis on just the fitness component of fitness initially. How did you navigate that? How did you get into some of the other pieces of the rest of soldier fitness, wellness, health, all that? Yeah, th- no, that's a great question. And and I'm going to give you a very, you know, how did I do it answer? Cause I don't know necessarily how my peers do it. What I'll tell you is it, from day one, that's where we were. Right. So, you know, like I said, I took command in, in July. Jason got here in May. So he was not much ahead of me. The brigade was really just starting to do organized PT again, coming out of COVID. But, you know, we already had a chaplain. We already had behavioral health. I already had a military physical therapist and a physical therapy uh, specialist. Right. So so some of these components are already there. So if you look at if you were to look at the, the annual training guidance I wrote, Uh, my first, you know, significant document, I guess, is the commander. The the first page of substance is all about H2F and it breaks down the five pillars and it talks to how we employ those five pillars to make soldiers fitter, faster, stronger, better. And, and, you know, we, we, we have this little thing that we do with, you know, fitness starts at the top of your head and goes all the way down to your toes because it embodies not only your muscles, but your bones, your joints, your heart hurt your mind faster is obviously talking to the fitness pillar stronger we go stronger here but stronger here and stronger here and i'm pointing my head and the heart in addition to flexing right and then the better part is the cognitive side of it of we are better more resilient more ready to do our mission like that so then it weaved into a talking point of like how do i message it organizationally and then we reinforce it with our steel fitness day or not steel fitness day excuse me the uh the uh uh, sharpening steel days where sharpening steel from the get-go that happens quarterly has always been a five faceted activity whether i'm going to grab the lieutenants and the sergeant first classes for one whether i'm going to grab all the battalion leadership uh hell we did one that was like 300 people across the brigade and we did a, a whole tr- day 
physical day in, in PTs that was tied to the other four pillars. So, you know, you've got to beat it all the time and you've got to reinforce it and you've got to be, you know, including it. Otherwise, you know, the cognitive performance specialist kind of becomes this afterthought. Well, not here because we have this 10 minute talk program where my other four pillars get in to the end, the last 10 minutes of PT and they're doing an education session. They're doing a training session. Susan, our cognitive performance specialist, she actually builds fitness. Like we do this one that's got these colored lights on it. And so one station in your H2S cycle is, is Susan. And you're doing this memory cognitive thing in the middle of your workout. Or, you know, at, at, on Tuesday, the, the nutrition specialist is down educating you on, on proper hydration or the evil of sports drinks or, you know, whatever. And, and so that's how we've done it is we've just packaged it all super huge and, and we constantly kind of roll it through through the program so that, you know, it, it's not just single faceted. You alluded to this a little bit, I think, in that last one, but to kind of discuss it and then ask it directly, we've seen programs like this come and go. I mean, I think every branch in the military has has come at this over the years in different ways and there's different acronyms and they're cool and then they go away. And, and I think there's certainly ways in which H2F specific to the Army is, is different. How do you think that we can go about making it so that it's not some other like it's not this this building that soldiers go to and utilize it becomes enmeshed in the day-to-day -day life of being being a soldier and maybe this opens up a conversation about what it means to be like a tactical athlete but I, again i go back to sort of this idea of in a professional organization you know a football team like using the strength coach the at the cognitive performance person like that's just part of your job as as being a top tier athlete but with the military and, and specific here to the army, like it's still, it's almost this nice to have and not this need to have. And I'd just be curious in your thoughts on like, how do we move the needle more into that direction of it becoming just part of your existence as a soldier? Yeah. So let me, let me talk a little bit about, you know, my, my 25 years of reflection. Cause I've been asked this question before. It actually got asked me last year at the H2F conference is uh, I was, I was, super hyped up and all this and and when I somebody came out with this question of like hey you're super excited but how does that translate you know we've done this before and I said actually we haven't done this before right we had the performance triad and what did we invest in performance triad a bunch of brochures that sat around the hospital we said we were going to go to a combat fitness test what did that do nothing it never developed we talked about hey we're going to redo the I think this is the fourth time we've talked about to changing the APFT. And then finally the answer was scrap it, go to something newer better, right? So my my answer to this has been, this is the first time in my 25 year career that the army has actually invested in the program. They have dedicated resources. They have committed personnel. GS positions are not to be, you know, scoffed at, right? You, you know, the contractors, you know, if this was all contract, I'd be like, eh, I don't know. We're investing GS civilians. We're investing, uh, you know, across the board in this because I think, at least in my personal opinion, and and, I, and I've said this before that it, you know, the reason I'm so committed to H2F is because I believe, I truly, truly believe that we're investing in the total soldier, which not only gives them a better military experience, it not only makes them a better military professional. But more importantly, post-military career, they have a better quality of life. Because wouldn't it be nice if the VA wasn't cutting out 75% disability to every soldier that leaves the 82nd Airborne Division? And, and I think that can happen if, if the piece, pieces of our program make our bodies more resilient, make us more, you know, I, I used to be a, a, I mean, I came in the Army as a huge runner, right? Like, well, actually, I, didn't. I came in the Army as a friggin' out of shape, fat pudgy little lieutenant that people were betting on whether or not I would finish the battery run. I'm not kidding. Not an athlete in high school, never did sports uh, in college. There, no joke was a bet that I would fail ROTC cadet camp because I wouldn't make the two mile run. Cause before I went to camp, I'd never finished a two mile run period. And then I come in the army, I pick up running. Uh, and, and then I become this distant runner guy, bunch of marathons, uh, and that was kind of my, my breed was, ah, I run all the time. And people ask me, well, why, how can you run injury free so much? I'm like, 
25 years of my life, I've been pounding the pavement. My joints are used to it. Well, if we get 25 years from now, soldiers who've done nothing but H2F, they're going to be stronger. Their joints are going to be better. Their movements are going to be better. Muscular body movements are going to save them from injuries. Like all of these things that translate from the weight room into the motor pool where they're moving generators and, and doing manual labor in the field, like it's going to give them a better quality of life in the end. And so that's why I think the army has, the army understands that probably way better than I do. I mean, I didn't make this program. I'm just executing it, but I think they see this as a long-term cure to some of our VA challenges and some of our disability challenges. And, and just that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we weren't always joking about how broke we were when we get out of the army. Right. So I, I don't know. I, I think I might've gotten on a, on a different vein there than, so I might have to have you re-ask the question. Cause I think I missed half your question. I got really fixated <laughs> on the first part. Of it. No, no, that was, that was perfect. But it, 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 and again, I don't want to bring up the, the earlier touching the earlier point we touched on about, you know, only measuring 600s on the ACFT. But I think in what you just said, you touched on a lot of intangibles. Like, for example, hey, like we're not as as broke as we used to be. What if that's the direction this goes in, but ACFT scores just kind of, you know, stay where they're at? Again, it's more of a devil's advocate question than anything else, but it's a curious talking point because I would argue that everything you just laid out is a phenomenal way of measuring success. It's just how do you do that in an environment it hinges upon so many objective touch points and, and how do we make it last 25 years if it's constantly under threat because you know stacked up next to something else that's proving objective success like you know where are we again not necessarily a question but more of just a maybe devil's advocate talking point yeah well you kind of ha you have a question in there though that, I, that i'll kind of push back on you a little bit i think the army has and, and you know sergeant grinson Listen to anything he said about either the ACFT uh, or or performance overall under the new expectations. Right. The Army has given us the latitude like the old APFT. If you weren't a 300, you know, you, you were you were subpar like 300 was success. I mean, remember, we actually had an extended scale for a while and, you know, all officers got judged on the extended scale and, you know, like, what? There is no extended scale. We just kept adding crap to the end because everybody could max, not everybody, a lot of people could max it, right? I think when you listen to the Sergeant Major of the Army say, hey, look, 600 is goal. 600 is not an expectation. I mean, even look at the way he just made the tweak to the Army Body Composition Program. Love it. Mm -hmm. Because now we're going to say, hey, if you want this, you have to accept that. But there's a, a minimum. He didn't set it at 90 per event. He didn't set it at 540 on the hardest grading scale, right? He didn't make it some unreasonable. It was like, hey, you know, where you are is where you're going to be assessed. And so, you know, my point about the 600 actually is you could almost argue that there's a second measure inside the 600 that's not the PT test, that's not, excuse me, the ACFT, right? Because Remember, I said every soldier should be motivated to achieve it. They may not, like physically, their body may not be able to achieve that. But if they are striving for that, if they are setting that goal, if they are improving themselves to get there, I would argue that the, the mental component of H2F is firing and winning. And we can use that as a see it's working because we have soldiers out there who are aspiring to achieve something. that The Sergeant Major of the Army has said few will. If you will. So you've, you've done this a little bit the last few minutes here, kind of like addressing some of the common challenges or common criticisms or things like that. I'm going to, I'm going to make it real for a second. Cause I'm always watching the news on like how people perceive army fitness, army health, all that stuff. And all within the last three or so weeks, I've seen several articles drop. We had a civil affairs major, write An army times piece talking about how the army can't get in shape. Cause it's unwilling to fix the like food environment, a stuff going on. Mm. We had an infantry major, right. That H2F is going to fail. We had like just a couple of days ago and everybody was talking about it, uh, a post on Reddit and that's obviously anonymous, but it appears whoever wrote it is probably somewhere around master sergeant, something like that. Writing H2F is going to fail because of the lack of buy-in. So there's, there's a lot of people and granted I was very much like refreshed when I looked in the comments and saw tons of people saying H2F is actually awesome. It's fantastic. What are you talking about? But 
there's clearly enough criticism that people are willing to like go out there and express really publicly that they don't think this program is going to last. What do you say to people who have that perspective? Like, do like how do you counter that when you hear it? Um, I I, I don't know that uh, that I encounter it because it's you know you know woe be the lieutenant who walks up to me and tells me H two F is garbage. <laughs> right. I, I'm pretty clear that it's my number one thing. Right. Like, like, I, I think you could probably do an anonymous poll in the brigade that says list these four things that the brigade commander cares about. And and the number one would always be H2F. Right. It, it, it just and I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just saying, like, that is central. It's 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 on boards around the brigade. It's posted everywhere. It's all I talk about. I'm sure people are freaking tired of it. But but for me, I'm so committed. to The success here is success there. You know, and, you know, you're going to get better certification scores, you get better weapon scores if you're more mentally prepared, if you can hang on in your head. I even said it the other day, we did a brigade four mile run, which arguably, you know, the Army says we do them. So we did them. I stood out front and said, hey, look, last time we had this many fallouts, some of those itty bitty tiny heart syndrome. If you can't stay dialed in for 36 minutes, can you stay dialed in in a firefight? And, and because I do think things like that reinforce each other. So, so I don't know if I'm a great answer on how do I counter the negative. I would say that I think that the major uh, that you said that wrote the article about the, the defects, good on him. Like mm-hmm. he's actually supporting the program. He's saying, you know, if we don't get our, our act, and this goes to the college thing, right? Uh, a football, college football linebacker, does not choose what he eats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He walks into the on the food table. They know exactly his diet. They put the food on his plate. He gets no like you know. We'll be into him if he freaking stinks off the Burger King at lunch because he's going to get crushed by his coach, right? That's where the program where we have a hard time saying soldier athletes need to be college athletes because unless we're going to put those kinds of things in, you know, my dietitian only has so much latitude. And she can't tell a soldier on the ABCP program, here's your meal plan, follow it or else. And you're going to log all your food on this app. And, you know, we don't have that kind of latitude with our team. And so I think that's a great one. You know, the the, the people who say, oh, it's not going to last. Okay. I mean, I, I hope they're all wrong. I, I don't really have an answer to them except for, Year to year, the program is going bigger and bigger and bigger as we put it in more and more places and we make more and more investments in it, right? Like, and again, I'm talking money, right? Follow the money and you find priority. And so, you know, when the army dropped 13 gym in the boxes in my brigade headquarters and said, hey, do it, I'm like, that's a multi million dollar investment in how we do PT. That, that's a big deal to me, you know? And so I, I think some of those naysayers are unfortunately probably in organizations that don't have it. Or I will tell you that even in, in, in my organization, you know, there is a stream of folks who, who will never buy in and, and we don't need to talk about fitness. Right. I, I had this, this one interaction with a, a mid grade NCO after one of our, our sharpening steel days. And I was like, Hey, you know, I was going around doing this thing where I was sticking my phone in their face going, Hey, tell me about the thing. Yeah. You know, I was doing this little man on the street interview thing for my social media, trying to be Insta famous. And <laughs> You know, I, I, I did it this one. So I was like, hey, what'd you think of the chapel? And he's like, yeah, I turned that shit off. Whoa, stop. Like, stop record. What? He's like, I'm not going to listen to all that religion stuff. I'm like, did you actually hear what he said? He's like, no, nah. as soon as he stood up, I quit listening. And, and so then I'm trying to convince him that just because it's the chapel and presenting material doesn't mean it's religious material. And that spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is connectedness. And spirituality is being part of something bigger. And like, you know, and da, 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 like you, you guys know the deal, but like, so, so there, there's going to be those kind of folks out there. I think the key is that the groundswell of excitement, the groundswell of positivity, the groundswell of quantifiable things we can show is good for the program are, are going to make the program sustainable because here, in my opinion, here's where we're winning, right? When we get a, an army senior leader coming through my installation, we get, you know, a, a visit by the vice president of the United States. And and she has lunch with four soldiers. And one of them says, she says, what do you need to fix the army? He says, ma'am, you know, we need we need more weights. Ma'am, you know, we need we need better food in our defects. 
when when those soldiers who spent two or three years here in their H2F are going to organizations that don't have it, saying, I'm going to copy what happened in that brigade as best I can, this thing, this thing becomes, you know, it, it just becomes its own thing. You know, I'm trying to figure out how do I go to my next assignment where I know there's no coaches, there is no H2F program, I, I'm, I am responsible for organization, but it's not a command. How, how do I bring in some of the tenants that I have learned here into that, you know, strategic level staff position? And, and I'll tell you, it, it may not go well for me. I'm going to get a lot of pushback and I'm going to get a lot of frustration because it's going to be new to them. But, you know, I've asked my soldiers to be disciples of H2F as they leave the brigade. I got part of that, too. So you mentioned in there that you're you're guessing, and it's it's a fair guess that some of the naysayers are in organizations that don't have any kind of human performance staff yet. Sure. I I worry, especially as we look across like tactical human performance in general beyond the army, beyond this program, that a bigger threat, and we hear this plenty of times from frustrated coaches and stuff, are organizations that do have human performance professionals and don't use them. How do we, and this is, this is kind of me asking you to talk to like your peers that are kind of in that space, but like, how do we fix that? Cause that seems like one of the biggest threats is if there are places where the, the investment has been made, the money has been spent and we're not seeing any benefit. How does that get fixed? I, I, I'd love to give you an answer. There isn't one because the, I, and I, and I said this a little bit earlier when, when I said the biggest danger to this program the biggest benefit is it's commander led. The biggest danger is it's commander led. And so, you know, if you, you know, get get a, a guy in who or a gal in who, you know, they have a different vision of fitness, there's a huge ca- capability sitting there that's going to go untapped and and the soldiers across that formation are going to struggle with it. M- my my optimistic hope is that senior leaders buying in are going to see that and then they're going to come down with the pressure, right? And they're going to say, Hey, if you're not using them, why don't I send them over there? And that, that the same thing's going to happen from the bottom up when, you know, coaches and leads particularly uh, are, are given feedback to their contract leads and to their program directors and that, Hey, we're not doing it, you know? And, and at the end of the day, these guys want to work. Like this, the 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 professional staff and something my press just said a long time ago. To me, a coach is everybody in the H two F. So when my chaplain is up talking about spirituality, he is the spirituality coach. My ATs are coaches. Like so, so we have a. I I have pushed through this coach mentality of everybody in the program. So I don't want. I, I keep saying coach, but I don't necessarily mean strength coach when I say coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, my PT doctor, medical doctor, he is a coach out at Reforger, right? So, so anyway, just kind of clear that up. But I think they want to be, you know, they want to, to make the organization better. And so I think that they'll complain and they'll be like, hey, this is a waste. And, and you know, so my hope is that senior leaders kind of come down from the top and go, you know, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, why, why, you know, as a leader, why would I want that responsibility to reshape my own program when I have all these pros standing around me? Like, that just doesn't, but, but again, that, that's not a good answer. Telling people what to do at some point, they got to believe in it. I'll ask you, I'll ask you a kind of maybe different version of the same sort of question, which is, do you, do you think that the culture of where the army is at now kind of innately supports the momentum of this kind of thing? Or do you think that we are the idea of embedded, embedded human performance is at odds with the culture, if that makes sense? No, I think, I think that, the the h2f program is absolutely feeding from the energy across the army i mean the energy from the army right now and and i you know before this i was i was in the in the big building doing some work i was there as the energy was changing to hey let's try different stuff let's be more innovative let's be more adaptive let's let's kind of you know it wasn't that long ago the sector of the army wrote a memo and said stop doing all this dumb stuff Right. Like, remember, the Secretary of the Army had to tell us to stop doing dumb stuff because it was in some regulation. So we all felt bound by it and we had to do it. And and so, you know, that that to me was kind of the tip that then started this new groundswell of like, hey, let's let's experiment with this new organization. Let's 
what if we had this person here, that person there, and then here comes H2F with, hey, let's reinvigorate our fitness program. Let's change the way we think about it. Let's let's get away from the red, yellow, green stickers at the DFAC, and let's just tell soldiers if they want 12 hard-boiled eggs for breakfast, they can have them. Like, let's not tell them one protein anymore. Right. So I think all of that is feeding off of this new this new dynamic of like, let's be food, let's adapt, let's change, let's figure things out. Let's 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 be creative. I, I think they completely support each other. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you talked about how a lot of the momentum comes from it being an investment in soldier performance and things like that. And we just putting their money where their mouth is. And I'm, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because the army has had pretty significant investments in soldier performance for years now. If you look at the army wellness centers, if you look at the R2 performance centers, if you look at the coaches that they have at MWR facilities, if you look at the various services at army community services, there's, there's a lot out there, but there's clearly something different when you put those capabilities directly under the commander's control, when you put it in the footprint, when you make it part of the unit. What what is it from your experience having been that commander who now has those capabilities within your unit? What makes it so different to have them under the same roof? What is that? You literally answered your own question. <laughs> you, you asked me a question, then you answered the question, which is exactly the answer to the question. What makes it different is it's not stovepiped, it's not some installation level thing, and it's in house to where we we own it like. The vibe inside of our H2F program is uniquely ours. I mean, the you know, you can go down the street to another unit, you can knock in with them, and and you're gonna get a different experience. Not not a bad experience, you're gonna get a different experience, right? But you know, and the other thing is all those other investments were were stovepiped, you know, the, the, with the exception of maybe the performance triad, which is a really nice 150 page book that nobody actually took the time to read, you know, it, <laughs> but like, what is our, what is army wellness program? Great program. You can go over there and you can get in a bod pod, which the army just scoffed at until, you know, maybe recently where we're going to embrace that. You could go over there and do a, do a, a, an RMR test and figure out what your caloric intake was, but there's no dietitian there to help you like build through that. Like it was a stovepipe. You you can go over to the Army Wellness Center and go, or uh, you can go to ACS and go, hey, I want some of this R2. And they'll come down and talk to you about resiliency and they'll talk to you about the cognitive piece. But but again, that's 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 not it doesn't put all of it together into one package of of how to overall make soldiers fitter, faster, better, stronger as a total package, putting all of these resources. You know, we we call our program Storm, S T O R M. Uh, and, and the acronym to me is not nearly as important as the fact that going around that logo is this big hurricane looking thing and, and smack dab in the middle between the letters is a dot. And, and to me, that is the perfect embodiment of the program, right? The five pillars are that tornado or hurricane going around it. And that dot in the middle is the soldier and all of that chaos around them is spinning towards them to make them the best version of themselves. I kind of like our logo. <laughs> I was going to say, I've seen it on a ton of emails. It's a nice logo. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty nice logo. Okay, so I want to work towards a closer because I know we've taken up about an hour and it's a two-parter. Yeah. So yeah, you mentioned kind of taking command, experiencing this sort of embedded human performance culture. So the first part of this is what is one thing that you have changed your mind on whether it's the idea of, of soldiers engaging in this kind of thing, whether it's the the way you can utilize a program like this, but where you're at now versus where you were when you took over, what's one thing that you've changed your mind on around this whole idea of embedded human performance in the army? Part one. I'm, I'm not frozen. I'm just thinking. Um, I, I don't, I don't, the reason I'm struggling is I don't know that your use of the word change my mind is kind of what I'm, I'm caught up on. Mm -hmm. We have evolved a lot of things over, over the 18 months that we truly had the staff here for the program. We, we have failed and failed fast at a lot of stuff. We've had some really clever ideas that we just thought would take off and then eh, eh, didn't exactly take off. Right. Um, so, so I don't know that it's, I don't necessarily consider that change my mind because we we're we we're trying to experiment. We we're trying to do something we we're like, I, I, you know, uh, uh, ability groups like that was an epic failure. I couldn't 
as much as I was personally convinced that testing people into ability groups result in better performance during PT because you're not working with your buddy, you're working with somebody that's going to push you and you have a collective group goal. It didn't work. Like mm. I, I could not get past the resistance of, of the leaders. We've hybrided that a little bit. There's some progress with it, but you know, running is probably the biggest place where it actually took hold uh, on our cardio days. But I think though, not, not to answer your question, but to say something to fill the space instead, the, the, the big challenge that I still mentally have where I don't think we are, are getting where we need to be is with the spirituality pillar. I, I think that the, the fitness pillar, super, super easy to embrace, mm -hmm. super easy to quantify success, super easy for like soldiers physically see it, right? They look at themselves in the mirror or they look at themselves on an old picture and go, holy crap, look at what's happened to me in six months, right? Like they see that's, that's very tangible to them. The sleep, I think we get it. I don't think we've invested in it enough. I don't actually have, we don't actually have a sleep pillar professional. We have an occupational therapist who tries to split their time between all of that. We don't have devices. We don't have data. We don't have gadgets. I think there's more we can do in that, in that realm, but, but that's kind of out of the control of, of me guiding the program as the commander mental. I, I think we're all over that. I think that, you know, the army's invested in that there's other tools and software, but like the, you know, how we pull the R2 components in, how we train leadership academies, all this great, like great. That's working just the way it should nutrition again, you know, that's quantifiable with the ABCP program. And, and as we're going to now embrace the embody and other stuff, like that's good. The, the one that I think has the hardest time is, is spirituality. And I, and I think I struggle with, have I led them well enough? Have I given them a guidance, enough latitude? Because, you know, you're fighting this, this cultural soldier come in with this preconceived notion of, of what that, that captain or major that, that actually wears their branch on their shoulder, on their chest, what they do versus what they're actually doing for H2F. And I think we've asked our chaplains, holy moly, we have asked them to do something super hard because mm -hmm. we've asked them to take and basically split themselves half their day. They are religious experts. They are cult, their advisors. They are bound by endorsers on, on how to do their thing and counseling. But then we've asked them to be staff officers who are responsible for this much, much broader, less, much less constrained H2F pillar, which at the end of the day, it's got to be there because, you know, if you if you don't believe you're connected to something else in this world, you're going to have a super hard time optimizing your performance. Right. And, and so in the brigade, we run this this thousand pound club. And we don't run it because I, I wanted to you know, give fancy certificates to people who can, you know, are super strong. It was because to me, it was a great way to, to say, Hey, look, if you have all five pillars running together, these are the kind of unbelievable things you can achieve because you can't crush Burger King four meals a day and go lift a thousand pounds. You can't sleep two hours a night, stay up all night playing video games and go lift a thousand pounds. You can't not feel connected at least to a gym community, your personal goals, your personal world, and go in there and have the mental strength to lift that weight. And, and so that's what thousand pound club does. But, but I just, I struggle with, have we given them the tools? Have we given them the guidance? Have we, have we found ways to, to make them go across the formation for that value to be out there so that people see it? I don't know that that's not of, of something I, I regret or I second thought. It's just like, I just don't know if we're there yet. I think, I think that's the, the hardest pillar to get our head around. And it's also the hardest pillar to to really push progress on and, and i think that you know collectively everybody that's buying in we we've got to help the chaplains we can't just give this to the chaplains and go hey go do spirituality stuff like like we we got to do better than that and i just mm -hmm. and i and i don't think that in my time i've done a very good job with that i know drew has a second part to the closer question yeah, I know we, we are come back. wrapping this thing up but you've you've brought up an issue that i think is is worth a little discussion we don't have to go too much farther down the rabbit hole because you laid it out really well but I think there's a huge conversation to have on it depend the, on the army's current iteration with H2F and certainly many other versions of human performance programs. There are no actual mental health professionals on the program. 
And I think that's fine. I think that is entirely appropriate depending on what your goals are. You have people that have like some skills in the the mental space, but there's there's no like person who's a dedicated counselor or something to treat behavioral health, whatever it is, you have to rely on other professionals for that. But at the same time, when we hear what senior leaders say about what they hope to get out of it and what we hear what their biggest concerns are, a lot of it centers around mental health issues, behavioral health issues, suicide issues, whatever it is. And you've identified that what spirituality is, is that connectedness. It's that greater sense of purpose. It's the community piece. It's all those things that if I had to like talk about what does preventive behavioral health look like, what does it look like to help somebody be more like sound in their mental health when they're not having an actual clinical issue of some kind, I immediately go towards all those sense of community, sense of connectedness, friends in your organization, whatever it is. And so well, it is the piece of the puzzle that's the hardest to get after, the hardest to quantify. We don't really know who owns it or how to do it. It might be the most important one. So I don't, that wasn't a question. That was just me rambling. But Well, so nobody told me that behavioral health is important part H2F because uh, I absolutely have pulled, formally pulled the brigade embedded behavioral health team into H2F. And, and so I guess that's my fault for not reading the rules. But like when, when I got here, they, they were part of both the mental pillar and the spirituality pillar. Uh, and, and they come to all my leads meetings. They are they provide data. They're like, you know, we're looking at trends. We're looking at Sud C. We're looking at like all of that. I, I have pulled you, know, you just educated me that I'm wrongfully using my EBH team because I have made them part of part of H2F. No, I think you're I think you're right on track. And I, I think that a lot of teams would benefit from doing the same. I think that every time I have bumped into embedded behavioral health stuff, they're too backed up with a massive backlog of appointments they're trying to get to to even yep. touch preventive. So, no, you're right. That, that 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 is a challenge of how much do I ask them to do staff stuff versus treatment stuff. You know, it, but you bring a great point. I, I would add to it that, you know, to, to me. And I might be a little off reservation here, but you know the fitness, I think, directly touches that preventative behavioral health. Right, you get a brand new soldier into your unit who's away from home, trying to make new friends, trying to fit in an organization, trying to do a job that they, you know, in six or eight weeks were trained to do. You instantly put them on a level playing field at six thirty in the morning, and so if they come in as an underperformer because they don't have a background in in fitness then they're going to build confidence week after week after week after week. If they come in as a, as a, you know, strong ranger, they're going to come in and be an equal all of a sudden to all these other people, which is going to give them confidence, which I think creates a connectedness. It creates a strength in themselves, you know, and, and I tell people this all the time, right? Like, uh, you know, if, if you, if you are struggling with your, your personal goals, because you feel, you know, the organization's in a cycle or whatever, Go to the gym because the first time you push 225 on the bench, I guarantee for two weeks, you're going to ride that high. You are going to be telling everybody, look at what I did, right? All of a sudden you have this big inflated sense of self-worth. You know, it doesn't have to be 225. It's whatever a PR is, right? But, you know, that feeds your ego and it feeds your personality. And then it can be something that you can catapult to of, hey, I'm having a bad day. You know what? I'm going to go push it out in the gym. And not again to over reinforce, you know, fitness is the most important pillar, but I think there's a reason it's the base pillar, right? Because there's a lot of things that can, can jump out from uh, strong performance. Well, you may have, you may have answered this the part two already. And and I want to make sure I ask it because we've, we've thrown this up before and got in trouble because we never really seem to get around to part two to this, but part one was one thing you've changed your mind about since taking command and, and kind of managing one of these programs. Part two What's one thing that you have doubled down on? One thing that you you kind of believe to be true when you showed up and now having seen this play out, you now are convinced that that is it is correct. Yeah. So the one thing I have the most doubled down on is that this program only works if if leaders buy in and leaders do. Right. So, you know, that th- this message that we put out in the brigade that, you know, we compete here to win every day and, and competition starts at six 30 in the morning when you compete against yourself held accountable by your peers and carries through your entire day. 
who can get the service done the fastest, who can score the highest on the certification, who can go to the range and score expert, who can, who can, you know, like that competition all flows, right? But, but if, if the mid-grade NCO leaders, if the first line leaders, if the lieutenants, if the captains, if they're not buying in, even if it's superficially at first, because they, you know, brand new, like I've never seen this H2F thing. I don't know what I'm doing, but the brigade commander said it's number one priority. So I'm in. Like as long as they do that, the program will flourish in that, in that respect. If they disconnect from it, if they discount pillars, if they don't embrace send and soldier steel fitness trainer uh, or P3C or reforger, then it fails, right? I mean, I, I have gotten this question before about, hey, man, how's your reforger program killing it so much? Because we invest in it. We train three E6s every quarter to run that program. We have two ATs dedicated to that program. I have cut away a gym box just for that program. They form up at 630 in the morning at reforger. There's an accountability formation at 630. Like, we have committed to it. And, and when I find a battery who's got a bunch of, non-deployable muscular skeletal profiles, my first question is, how many in Reforger? Uh, well, sir, only two are because the other five are like, we're no, 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 you don't have the authority. Like I have said, this is a program, you're going to send them over there, right? So then it takes my enforcement to get compliance to get the buy-in. And then all of a sudden they see their soldier come back healthy and now they're buying, it, right? And, and so I, I think that's absolutely where, where I double down is just this insatiable, uh, forcefulness of of making sure top to bottom everybody's doing it you know when i came when i took brigade command uh and ac2f wasn't really in i mean i was guilty i would run the six mile loop on monday morning and inevitably i would see a battalion commander and sergeant major i'd see a couple field grades i'd see a battery commander like so if you're if, you know if you're doing it and you're seeing them do it and it's counter to what you want then i guarantee you're not getting it right I will tell you right now, I don't think there's a single soul in this brigade that at 6.30 in the morning runs a six month. Like, why would they? They've got H2F, and they know that, you know, the battalion commanders, the SAR majors, and I, and everybody else, we're out. We're out with them doing PT. And so, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, to your words, double down on the whole, you know, presence and buy-in is, 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 is the recipe to success. Well, there you go. I can't imagine a better closing statement. So Colonel Harvey, thank you for your time. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to know that this was your first podcast. You nailed it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, hey, I get, again, I get criticized to be in uh, short and brief all the time. So I, pre I appreciate you guys. You know, this was a lot of fun for me. I, 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 I'm so in on, on H2F for all the right reasons, personally, professionally. Uh, and it is absolutely you know, a passion. So I, I love, I appreciate you guys inviting me on. It's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, more importantly, it's just given me a chance to, you know, pontificate on, on why I think this is just, just absolutely the right way for the Army to go. Well, here's awesome. to making you famous. So thank you. Thanks for that, guys. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and we receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in-depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.